Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius, and welcome back to the Fortress of the Mind podcast. And in this podcast, we're going to be discussing conduct obligations and decision making. And this is a podcast that is meant to accompany the release of my book, On Duties, my translation my translation of Cicero's On Duties, which is now posted on Amazon. And there's also a link to it posted on the post on my website that announces this podcast. So you can go and take a look at it there. The, um, the Kindle version will be available on July 1st. But the paperback version, I guess, is available now, just the way they Amazon sets things up. So if you are interested in the paperback version, you can get that now. It's available now. But what I wanted to do in this podcast was to talk a little bit about the book, what's in the book, how I put it together, what I think readers should take away from it, and what its significance is. So we'll go ahead and do that tonight. And to be perfectly blunt, to start out, this is the most readable, the most explanatory, the best organized, and the most comprehensive comprehensive version of Cicero's On Duties that's available today in English, maybe in any language. Now, I realize that's a bold statement, but it's a statement that by any objective measure is obvious and true. And I'm more than willing to compare my version with any of the existing versions. And I think readers will see immediately that the version that I've produced over a period of a year and a half is the one that's most in keeping with the spirit of the age, is the most accurate, most readable, most easy to use. This is a book that's meant to be studied and used, not a book that's meant to sit on the cold shelves. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I get more and more into the podcast. But this is a book that's meant to be used. And, you know, I, I now to start out, I can basically just say that this, I tell you what, folks, this, this one took a lot out of me. This was hard. <laughs> and I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining at all. I'm just making a statement of fact. This was hard. This, was, this took basically a daily effort over a period of of about a little over a year and a half. And I started it because really of love. I mean, if, if there's really one word that I can bring out that binds together all of the connective threads in this whole project, it's love. Why do we do things? What What makes our heart beat? What gives us that passion that makes us put one foot in front of the other? and allows us to continue forward, it's love, it's passion. And I've always been passionate about these things for a lot of reasons. There's such an inexplicable grandeur and majesty in these old writings that I just feel touches me on some fundamental level, and I just want to share it with the world. I have to share it with the world. And that's really one of the motivating reasons why I started to write some years back because I was just inspired and animated by this zeal. And there is no other word for it. Pure zeal. And I want to make that enthusiasm infectious on all the rest of you. And I hope that my enthusiasm is infectious and will um, generate the interest that you need to to ponder these things and, and to take up the study of these things. But it wasn't easy. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I have to say that translating a, a classic text, I think any text in general, is harder than actually writing something totally new. I mean, in, in a way, when you're translating, you are writing something totally new. But when you're translating as opposed to actually just writing free freehand without any boundaries, without any guides. You know, say I, I've I've written many books where I've just that obviously that are not translations, like Thirty Seven Pantheon uh, Pathways. Those are just were written by me, and those were a lot of work, obviously. But 
When you're translating something, you have to be conscious of every sentence, every phrase, every word. You have to make sure that you are staying faithful to the to the mood of the original while at the same time giving it giving it its proper voice for the modern era. So it's not easy. And it's been a very uh, eye-opening experience. I translated uh, Cicero's um, Stoic Paradoxes last year. And that was a shorter work. And that was a good preparation for this one. But you really have to be prepared to go the distance. I mean, towards the end, it was just like, wow, you know, this is this is uh, this is tough. This is really tough, you know, because you have to be conscious of every phrase, every word. And that's really what separates the men from the boys. That's really what's going to separate a mediocre translation from something that's truly great. Something that's truly great. And that's what I was aspiring to. So, I and anyone who, who, who thinks otherwise should try it for themselves. Anyone who has studied a foreign language, doesn't matter what language, Spanish, French, Russian, Chinese, whatever, try to translate something. Start out with maybe newspaper articles. Start out with short stories. And you'll see what I mean. You'll see what I mean. Sometimes things just flow. And there are other times when almost no sentence will give you a satisfactory rendering. And you'll be very frustrated and you'll have to fall back on your wits, and you'll have to do the best you can. And you have to revise. You have to do it, let it sit, come back to it, do a little bit more, let it sit, come back to it. It's an ongoing progression. So that's the background. And what really was the other motivating uh, impulse that I had was I wanted to bring this classic to a modern generation of readers because I feel like these are things that used to be taught in the schools a hundred years ago and most young guys young girls have no idea this stuff even exists and when they really see what's out there when they really see how great this stuff is they'll get a whole new perspective on life and not just that but we all need training in conduct obligations and decision making and I've made that sort of the subtitle to my book um, rather than just title it On Duties, I wanted to explain what it's about. Because a lot of people would say On Duties, well, what the hell is that about? What is that? I don't even know. Uh, that, sounds, that sounds boring to me. I don't want to know anything about that. Well, this is the original self-help guide. This is about conduct, obligations, and decision-making. The treaties is divided into three sections. You have a first section that talks about moral goodness or moral rectitude. There's a second book which talks about expediency or advantageousness. And then in the third book, Cicero talks about what happens when expediency and advantageousness come into conflict. How do you resolve situations when what looks morally right is not necessarily expedient and also vice versa? How do you handle those situations? And I talk a lot about this in the preface and the introduction to the book, which you'll be able to see in a few days. But what I argue is the connective thread, the truly significant connective, connective thread that binds together all of the subjects in this book, and it deals with many, many subjects, is the concept of greatness of soul. We have to have greatness of soul if we want to survive and prosper in this world. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming minutes here. So now that we've laid some groundwork, let me talk about why my translation is different from the others and why my translation, frankly, is better than the others. So allow me to make my case to you. I want to make my case to you and let you decide. So I'll talk about that now. I think the best way we can look at this translation overall is to say that my book departs from its predecessors in three important respects. Three important respects. There's long been a need for a new translation of On Duties, and there's three reasons why mine is different from the others. First, and most compellingly maybe, most of the existing translations were done many years ago. And even though those efforts may have been adequate for their era, 
whether it was Edwardian era, Victorian era, the 1920s, 30s, 40s, whatever. Those efforts may have been adequate for their era, but they begin to show their age after a certain point. The modern reader is demanding. The modern reader wants something accurate and readable, yet at the same time which preserves the classic patina of the original. Now, I've looked at a lot of the existing translations, and the problem is that most of them confront the reader with such a hopeless mass of semicolons, stacked clauses, archaic 19th century diction, and knotted sentences, that reading them is a chore more than a pleasure. All right. Uh, Cicero was an eloquent stylist. He was conscious of his audience. And any translation should strive to do faith to that fact. Because we have to remember that Cicero was always the lawyer. He was a lawyer. He was a, an advocate first and foremost. He always argued his points with force, with conviction, and with clarity. And when he, when he repeats himself, which he does often, he does it deliberately. When he castigates political opponents, when he uh, chews out his political enemies, he does it for a reason. And when he tells us multiple times that nothing uh, can be expedient, which is also not morally good, he does so deliberately. These are not accidents. He knows that juries, like book readers, need emotional connection to the subject matter. They need summary. They need repetition. And... All of the existing translators, because they're not trial attorneys by profession, they miss this point. They don't get it. But those of us who have tried cases before juries, like me, and I'm not aware of any other translator of on duties who was also a trial attorney, they see the method and purpose in Cicero's rhetoric. The translator must not veer too much in either direction. Okay, He didn't Cicero did not write like a Victorian or, or uh, uh, Edwardian novelist, all right? But at the same time, he didn't sound like Hemingway either. We can't modernize things too much. A good translation should be redolent of its period. It should speak of its era. We should not only understand the text, we should be brought back to the era. So when you're translating these things, you have to go about the task carefully keeping these points in mind. The needs of the modern teacher or instructor should not be allowed to suffocate the original author's words or the spirit of the original. So what I've done is try to aim for that balance. I've deliberately avoided a robotic one-for-one -one equivalence of translation because I think that would be reckless and irresponsible. Latin is very different from English. And what might be understandable and logical in a Latin sentence is not if we were to robotically just translate that to an English sentence. So every language beats with its own heart. And the translator has to keep his fingers carefully on the pulses of both the original and the target idiom to be effective. So that was a concern. We have to understand our man. We have to understand our author. When Cicero, we have to know when he, you know, when he means I, when he writes we. You know, he can be evasive and slithery one moment and brutally frank at another moment. And sometimes his meaning resides in his qualifications and hesitations and so on. So that was the first reason, the first way that my translation differs from the others. Secondly, and this is also very, very important, I noticed when I would look at existing translations of this book that they were very, very, they were impossibly organized. There was no way to locate subjects quickly, uh, efficiently, and readily. And On Duty deals with dozens, maybe even hundreds of topics. And a lot of the previous versions, they try to use marginal notes, you know, these little squibs in the margins of the books. Well, that, that doesn't really solve the problem either. Because I can tell you there's no existing Kindle, there's, there's no good organized Kindle version of this classic, you know, never mind uh, hard copy, never mind paperback. There's not even any good existing Kindle versions of On Duties. So what I came up with was the idea of incorporating into Cicero's uh, 
Well, classical texts are divided into books and chapters and subsections. So what I did was I you know, kept the division of the books and chapters, obviously, but I gave, in the beginning of, at the outset of the book, in the table of contents, I described, I gave descriptive points of what each chapter contained so that someone looking at the table of contents can immediately see what's in each chapter. There's also a, an exhaustive index at the end of the book in the paperback version, which you, you can also use for cross-reference. But you can see right in the beginning of the book what each chapter and what each book is fully and completely about. So you can very easily go to see whatever subject you want to locate. If you want to know about real estate transactions, you can find that, you can go to that. If you want to know about the law of war, you can find that and go to that. If you want to know about commercial contracts, you can go to that. If you want to know about decorum, about how to behave, about how to uh, be, uh, about friendship, about severing friendships, you can go right to those subjects immediately without any qualification or worries because it's all there. I've done all the work for you. I've done all the work for you. All you have to do if you have the Kindle version, you can just click on the subject heading and it'll take you right to that point in the text. And then you can use the Kindle reader to navigate back and forth as you, as you go. Brilliant. And this is what's needed to organize a classical text in the modern era. You need, you need to have not only an index, but you need to have a descriptive table of contents in the beginning that answers the mail. Because if you look at some of these other editions, all they just says in the tale of contents, it just says book one, book two, book three. Well, that doesn't tell me anything. That's of no use to me. No use at all. Doesn't answer the mail. So organization is important to me. And it's important to have readers be able to locate a term or topic easily. So... That's the second point. Thirdly, thirdly, existing editions of On Duties do not explain enough. Okay? The modern reader requires descriptive footnotes that presume no previous knowledge of Roman history or the Latin language. We don't live in a world anymore where everybody knows this stuff. I wish it were so, but we have to be realistic here. And a translator can no longer take it for granted that a reader in 2016 will recognize, for example, the names uh, Regulus or Titus Manlius Torquatus. I wish they did, but they don't. And that's okay. That's okay. So most versions of On Duties in the past were produced for audiences in the previous century who were assumed to have some knowledge of Roman history or Latin or both. My book presumes, my book presupposes no such knowledge. It's accessible to all. It's truly democratic. It's accessible not just to students of the classics, but to everyone. I have about 260 footnotes in this book filled with every possible reference. Every name is identified and explained. Every confusing term is explained so that when you're reading through the book, if, you, if you're using the Kindle version, for example, you see a footnote, you just click on that note, you're taken right to the back of the text, it explains it, and then you can just click back and pick up where you left off and keep reading. If you're using the paperback version of the book, you will see the footnote at the bottom of the page, and you'll see it all there. And that's important to me. Exhaustive descriptions, because that's what I want when I'm reading a book. I want... I expect the editor and the author to explain things. Don't just throw out names and words. Define your terms, as Socrates used to say. Define your terms. State what you mean. So, while this book is intended for the general reader, it's also providing enough rigorous detail to meet the needs of the serious student. So, with all those three, three reasons that I just summarized, those three reasons, that's, those are the reasons why I believe, why I know my version is a significant achievement in scholarship. This is important. This is not only a significant achievement 
in literary efforts, but this is a significant achievement in scholarship. And by any, by any objective standard, this is a milestone. This is a milestone. And I have to say it, because if I don't say it, who the hell else is going to say it? So, those are the things that I would ask that readers keep in mind. And the last thing I'll say, and the, the thing that I think is most important, is On Duties is a profoundly ennobling vision of man. This is not just a, a, a poor Richard-esque uh, lexicon of, hey, do good and avoid bad. This is not like that. This is something very different. It's something very special. Because it's something that tries to make us better men. It exalts us. It calls out to us. It implores us to be better men. Through this concept, concept that I argue, it's called magnitudo animi. Magnitudo animi, greatness of soul, greatness of spirit. And that truly is the hallmark of a great man. That's truly the hallmark of a great man. And if you feel it, if you are in the presence of it, you will know what that is. Let me first read to you what Cicero says about that. This is from, I'm going to read right from my book, right from my translation. Of what does Cicero define greatness of spirit as? Let me read that for you. I'm looking here at Book 1, Chapter 20. And I'm going to click, I've got the Kindle edition in front of me here for speed of reference. And I'm going to click on the features of a great soul. Let me read this to you. And this is a great passage. Let me tell you, this is a great, this is a great passage. It doesn't get any better than this, people. If this doesn't move your soul, you need to check your pulse. You need to check your pulse because your heart is pumping Kool-Aid. You know? Anyway, Book 1, Chapter 20. I'll read Cicero's words here. He says, A strong and great soul is altogether distinguished by two features. One is the contempt for the external things of this world. The great soul is persuaded that no man ought to wonder at, hope for, or seek after anything except those things related to goodness and virtue, and that he should succumb to neither another man nor a disturbance of the spirit, nor a trial of fortune. The second feature is that when you have molded your soul with this sort of attitude, as I said above, you perform great achievements of the highest utility which are extremely arduous, laborious, and full of danger to life and to many other things related to one's livelihood. Of these two features of a great soul, all splendor and greatness, and I may also add utility, come from the latter quality, but the origin and reason for making men great derives from the former. In the former feature is that quality which makes souls great and contemptuous of baser things. This same thing is separated into two aspects. First, that you judge moral goodness to be the only good Second, that you are free from all distress of the soul. We must remember that with regard to those things seen by the majority as attractive and wonderful, there are a select few that great souls who will look down on these same things as unworthy and disdain them as firm and stable life principles. A robust soul, a great and, and great constancy, are also needed to bear the bitter experiences of life, which fortune often and in unexpected ways visits on us, so that you are in no way deflected from your natural course or from the dignity of human wisdom. And that's the end of that quote. That's, again, Book 1, Chapter 20. What a, what a beautiful passage. I mean, no, no, one, no one writes like that anymore. No one can convey that greatness anymore. But it resonates. It should resonate with you, and it resonates with me. Because it's true. That's what's so great about it. It's true. Because when you are really in the presence of a great soul, you know it. You can just feel it. And even an intervening distance, maybe, if you're communicating with someone by email, by phone, you can feel the greatness. You can just feel it. I have a friend in Australia, a great guy. 
and he's the guy that I dedicated one of my books to. His name is goes by the name of Anonymous Bosch, and I'm sure I'm sure he's listening to this podcast now. I hope he is. And this is a guy that I would say has magnitudo animi, greatness of spirit, greatness of soul. And it doesn't matter that we're we've never met in face to face. It doesn't matter that we're separated from an ocean as wide as the Pacific. None of those things matter. What matters is the feeling. You can feel the greatness of spirit just by the words, by the attitude, by the things that such a person talks about. And that's really what makes greatness. It's that spirit. So I hope I've tried to, I hope that I've been successful in summarizing a little bit about the book, On Duties, which I've subtitled A Guide to Conduct Obligations and Decision Making, which is going to be available in Kindle on July 1st. The paperback is available now, so you can go and check that out. And if you have any questions on it, I'll certainly be happy to answer any of them. You can email me with questions. I'd be happy to do that. Hope everyone has a good weekend. Get out there and enjoy life because life is for the living. Drive safe, be safe. And this podcast was brought to you courtesy of Fortress of the Mind Productions. I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night.